Now, at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, cosmology was sort of ill-defined. After Newton had come up with his uh, law of gravity, uh, late 16, early 1700s, it was understood that gravity was the dominant long-range force in the universe. The force of gravity extends out infinitely far, although weaker and weaker, and it's an attractive force, so things pull, thing, things pull on each other together. This implied that since all the stars should be pulling on all the other stars, everything in the universe eventually ought to collapse down into one big clump in the middle. And obviously it hasn't done that yet, so why not? This was a problem that plagued cosmologists for oh, a couple of hundred years or so. How to avoid the collapse of the universe under the law of gravity. And they came up with the idea that the universe must be infinitely large and infinitely, uh, uh, fairly evenly distributed with stars. This would solve the problem by having, on any given star, the force of gravity would be equal, pointing, pulling it left, right, up, down, forward, and back. And those forces, rather than pulling the star apart, would actually cancel each other out, and everything would just float evenly in space that way. This would avoid the collapse problem. The, having an infinite universe also avoided the problem, more philosophical problem, of having an edge to space. What happens with an edge to space? If you walked up to the edge of the universe and stuck your finger out of it, what... You know, what happens then? How can you have an edge to a dimension uh, of space? And for similar reasons, uh, again, a bit more uh, philosophical, they didn't like having an edge to time either. And as they started thinking of time and space as uh, dimensions geometrically then, uh, it made sense that if you don't have any edges to the spatial dimensions, you shouldn't have any edge to the time dimension. So this meant that the universe was probably infinitely old. Now, around 1930, uh, Edwin Hubble, American astronomer, was working on unusual redshifts to the so-called spiral nebulae. These are what we today just call spiral galaxies. But back then, they didn't realize that these were galaxies outside the Milky Way. They thought that they were spiral-shaped nebulas inside the Milky Way. Although I'll point out that uh, the philosopher, theologian, and astronomer... Um, I'm, I'm blanking on it now. Uh, fully. Um, who had pretty much saved, uh, saved philosophy after David Hume's skepticism. Well, I'll think of his name in a minute. Anyway, it had been suggested in the 1700s that these were outside galaxies. Nevertheless, that didn't really catch on. So, Hubble is following up on some work by Georges Lemaitre, Belgian cosmologist, and some earlier work that these spiral nebulae had unusual redshifts, larger than you would expect for stars moving around the Milky Way galaxy. So he follows up and notices, does a systematic study of the distances of these. And Hubble finds that if you make a, a plot where you plot the uh, recession velocity, the speed at which these galaxy, the, sorry, the nebulae are moving away from us, which you get from the redshifting. Redshift gets you velocity moving away from you. That's easy to measure. And then you do some very hard work and you find, say, variable Cepheid stars in these galaxies that let you measure the distances to them a bit more directly. Then you find out that the recession velocity is proportional to the distance. If you plot this, you get a nice straight line. between the two. And we scientists love to have straight lines in our fits because we can just fit the equation of a straight line to this. y equals mx plus b, where m is the slope and b is the y-intercept. Now in this case, uh, your y-axis is the velocity, it's moving away from us, from redshift. Your x-axis is the distance, which you've had to measure from some other technique. And your slope is, uh, we'll call that h, which is now known as Hubble's constant, hence the h. The slow, and, and by the way, the y-intercept is zero because we are not moving away from ourselves. So at a distance of zero, you're moving a speed of zero away from you. We tend to measure the distances 
in megaparsecs, millions of parsecs, and we tend to measure the velocities in kilometers per second. So the slope, Hubble's constant, uh, is in the odd units of kilometers per second of speed per megaparsec of distance. And this is the expansion rate of the universe. So Hubble figured out that the universe is expanding. The farther away you look at a galaxy, the farther away a galaxy is from us, the faster away it's moving from us. And this works out rather nicely if space is expanding evenly in, uh, uh, in all places. Um, now, this turns out to be a useful tool for measuring distances to the really far galaxies. You can only see these variable stars in them out to so far before the stars are just too faint to make out, and for that matter, uh, you don't make out individual stars in the very distant galaxies because they're so far away all the stars blur together. So if you know what Hubble's constant is, the expansion rate of the universe, then you can take the redshift, which is very easy to get from a chemical spectrum. You use that to measure the recession velocity. That's a very simple uh, redshift. gives you the recession velocity. And then you just plug that into, uh, that's V, um, and you solve for D, the distance there, and you've got your distance. Now this only works for galaxies that are not real close to us, because one's very close to us, like say the Andromeda galaxy are actually gravitationally pulled together. So the Andromeda galaxy is moving towards us because we have this mutual gravitational pull and the uh, it's blue shifted because of that. So which will give you a, it's got a negative red shift in that sense. And so that, that doesn't work. So once it's far enough away that the expansion of space carries the galaxies apart on its own, then this works fairly nicely. And you've got to correct for a few other things. Now the trouble has been for most of the 20th century, we did not have a good handle on the expansion rate of the universe, Hubble's constant. Hubble thought that it was about 500 kilometers per second per megaparsec, and that was because of some problems in measuring the distances that he had. Again, the redshifts are easy to do. The distances are the hard part. Um, once that was taken care of by maybe the 1960s or so, then um, things settled down to debates over whether Hubble's constant was 50, or a hundred. Now think of this, we're arguing over a factor of two. In astronomy, that's considered not that bad. In other areas of physics, or heaven forbid chemistry, that would be outrageously large errors. Uh, but the universe is a big place and it's hard to do some of the statistics. So uh, we were arguing over that factor of two right up until the mid-1990s, and uh, by the late 1990s, early 2000s, we finally had it nailed down to our best estimate now is about 72 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And this leads us on to the Big Bang Theory and to issues of dark energy, which we'll get to in another lecture.